Hello, and welcome to the Acadius Pediatric Readiness Airway Simulator. In this simulation, we're going to go over one of the most anxiety-provoking procedures in pediatric critical care, that of a patient with acute respiratory failure who needs airway resuscitation and eventual intubation. And while we won't go over the intubation itself, we're going to go over the room setup, we're going to go over all the equipment that you may need to make this procedure less anxiety-provoking and as, as successful as potentially possible. So let's start with the patient itself. So you can see that our pediatric patient is here. And like many pediatric patients, they fit kind of a Charlie Brown cartoon mode that they have a large head with a relatively small body relative to the rest of their frame. So having that patient as close to the top of the bed as, as possible will make it uh, best so that you don't have to reach over to instrument the airway. And we'll usually do this by having respiratory therapists and nurses help us with us at the head of the bed as the physicians to move them up to the top. The room itself, let's go over for a second, and this is a typical pediatric ICU. In a typical pediatric ICU, the things that we're going to need are oxygen, medical air, suction, electrical outlets, a monitoring system, equipment. And in this setup, this room is uh, arranged with a boom system where all those different pieces are on a mobile boom that could be moved around the room. Others have all that equipment behind me on a head wall, and neither one is better or worse than the other. They're just different. The monitoring itself, we'd like to have our pediatric patient have all the vital signs displayed. So we'd like to have heart rate continuously displayed. We'd like to have respiratory rate continuously displayed. And as you can imagine, in a patient with respiratory failure, that may be very fast or very slow. We'd like to have pulse oximetry displayed continuously. And as you can imagine, when we're intubating a patient, that sometimes may be low. We'd like to have the ability to monitor end tidal CO2 continuously once our breathing tube is inserted to help us get a gauge of what their carbon dioxide in the bloodstream is and if the tube has been successfully placed. We also want to have um, the monitor be within our eye line if possible so we can see it. But if not, a great trick is that your pulse oximeter mode in almost every monitor that you could purchase in your hospital will have an audio display mode. So you can turn on an audio representation of the child's pulse oximetry. As their pulse ox falls, you have a, de a decrement in the tone of the beeping and you know that you get need to get the airway in faster. So once we have our patient properly positioned at the top of the bed, I'll often ask the nurses to lower the side rails and the respiratory therapist on my left to lower their side rail so they'll be able to get to the patient and help me when needed. And often in many typical PICU beds, the headboard is removable. So we'll often just take this off, sit it to the side so we can directly access the patient. Now, again, the patient himself, we'd like to have close to us and then place in this head tilt, head tilt, chin lift position. So using my hands, I will often put them on either side of the patient's cheeks and slightly rotate up and tilt their head so that they almost look like they're lifting their nose to smell something that smells good. This is going to open the airway. In a pediatric patient, if their chin is too far down, their airway will be obstructed. And if their head is pinched too far back or pulled too far back, they'll also be obstructed. So we want that kind of optimal sniffing position. Now, because of that big head, little body scenario that we described earlier, we'll often have to put a shoulder roll behind their shoulders, a rolled up towel or blanket to get them in that position and stay in that position. Or we may need to put a gel pad behind their head to keep their head tilted back in the way that we want it to be. Next, let's go over some of the equipment now that the patient is properly positioned. So key to any intubation is going to be to be able to breathe for the patient while they're not able to do that for themselves after they've been anesthetized with different sedatives and uh, neuromuscularly blocked with different paralytic agents. So we often have a bag mask resuscitation. Um, this will be plugged into this green oxygen flow meter to deliver oxygen to this bag. This bag is called an AMBU bag. Typically in pediatrics, we use a flow inflating or Mapleson balloon bag, but an AMBU bag works just as well. It has a certain amount of tensile strength within the plastic of the tubing so that you can squeeze the bag and then it will refill on its own. So once we've kind of connected our oxygen to our oxygen flow meter, we can apply the mask to the patient's face with a very specific technique. They're in that sniffing position, 
and using my left hand, I'm going to deliver oxygen and deliver breaths to make the child's uh, chest rise. With the mask itself, I'm going to make a C and E position around the mask. So after I apply to the child's face, my index finger and thumb will make a C shape around the mask itself to hold a seal to the child's face. And then using my middle finger, ring finger, and pinky finger, I will place those down on the bony part of the jaw and lift the patient up to me. So the key technique for proper masking is not to mash the mask down on the patient's face, it's to apply a good seal so that air doesn't leak, and then pull the child's face up to you. In lifting them into that sniffing position and using these fingers on the jaw, you'll unobstruct the airway and you'll move the, the tongue back into the mouth so it'll get kind of out of your way when you want to instrument the airway. Again, bagging technique is so that you can see the patient's chest rise. Often on the boom system, you can hook up a manometer to the bag and tell exactly how many centimeters of water pressure you're using to make the chest rise. But a good rule of thumb is make the child's chest visibly rise and we'll often remove their shirt when we put on their monitoring, have a gown on them, but pull the gown down so we can see the chest as we bag mask resuscitate the patient. Bag mask resuscitation may be more important and a more difficult skill than intubation itself. So next, let's talk about suction. So you can see on the front part of our boom, we have a suction canister hooked up and you can dial up the vacuum pressure to that. But when intubating a patient, I often want two types of suction. So I'll have one uh, cord that has rigid suction or a yank hour suction that'll be able to get thick secretions out of the patient's airway. And then snaking around to the right side of the bed, I'll give my nurse or my assistant a 10 French flexible suction catheter that I can place into the nair or into the mouth itself and snake down to the posterior pharynx to get secretions that are going to be obstructing my view when it's time to try to intubate the patient. Next, let's go over a couple airway adjuncts. So a patient, again, pediatrics with a relatively larger head to the size of their body, a relatively larger tongue to the size of their mouth, even with good chin lift, head tilt positioning, even with good mask, um, bag mask resuscitation skills may still have obstruction due to their tongue. So often we will use an oral airway to try to instrument them and get their tongue out of the way. The oral airway also has a channel in the center that you can use to place a suction catheter in and help get secretions out. So the way to insert the oral airway is usually to get good mouth opening with your left hand and directly insert midline. Now, the measurement of the size of the oral airway is important. So usually we measure from the corner of the mouth to the angle of the jaw. And this oral airway is probably a little bit bigger than what we need, but we often want to have one size above, one size below, and the intended size just in case we've chosen uh, incorrectly at the beginning. It's always better to kind of have a Boy Scout motto of be prepared, have more equipment than you need and not need to use it instead of having less equipment than then you have to get in an emergency fashion. So this oral airway, when put at the corner, corner of his mouth, comes nicely to the angle of his jaw and would probably be the perfect size. So again, with good mouth opening and midline insertion, the oral airway can help aid you in suctioning and bag valve mask resuscitation. Some people will put it in upside down and then flip it to get the tongue out of the way. I don't find that technique that useful, but some people like to do that. A second airway adjunct that we'll go over now is the nasopharyngeal airway. So the nasopharyngeal airway is useful in a patient that maybe is not too sedated. And I should mention the oral airway, most patients are not gonna tolerate that unless they're completely anesthetized. But a patient that's somewhat sedated but not completely anesthetized will tolerate the insertion of an NP airway. So an NP airway is useful for patients with very large tonsils, very large adenoidal tissue who may have stertor, that kind of rumbling sound as they try to take a breath in from airway obstruction at the top of their uh, pharynx. Being able to place this into the nair after it's been properly lubricated with some water-soluble gel is a simple procedure where you insert it into the nair until it's flush with the patient's face. And then you can, of course, grab your bag mask and bag as we've already kind of described. Now, the NP airway is useful because you can also suction through that as well. 
So it does have a channel, a bevel in the center that you could put a suction catheter in. It may not fit a 10 French, but you could fit something smaller down there and get secretions that are deeper that may be blocking your view while you do your laryngoscopy. So we've reached the point where we've kind of gone over how the room should be properly set up the equipment that we need on the boom that will help us, the monitoring that we're going to talk about. So let's go over a little bit of intubation. And again, this scenario is not designed to show you how to intubate a patient, but to go over some of the things to get you ready. So here you'll see our laryngoscope, which is essentially a flashlight. And it can be used to insert into the mouth and expose the larynx with the distal distal light that can light up that area for you. This is our breathing tube, and I'll go over a couple features of that. So both of these things are going to be based on size of the patient. The blade length is um, relative to the size of the patient's jaw and mouth. The double zero is the smallest blade possible for premature infants 23 weeks, up to adult sizes, which would be a Miller 3. Millers are the straight blades. Macintosh are the curved blades. I prefer the curved blades themselves because they help get the pediatric tongue out of the way. But there's no right or wrong, depending on what you're most comfortable with. Some people like the Millers, some people like the Max. In a, in a patient this size, a whisk hipple blade, which is an in-between size between a 1 and a 2, it's a 1.5 size, is probably going to be the most useful. So, Holding it in your left hand as you see me holding it here, you're going to go midline. You're going to use your right hand and your index finger to open the child's mouth and use your thumb to lever them as wide open as possible. Some people will turn the blade sideways, put it into the right corner of the mouth and rotate it. Other people go straight in. But the idea is to get the tongue out of the way and then watching the handle of the blade and your thumb to lift in the direction upward, not to rock back as there is a risk of breaking teeth. So kind of putting the blade in midline and lifting up and away from yourself will get your best exposure to the trachea. The breathing tubes themselves have several different features I want to talk about. So you can see that they have in the top of them a rigid um, wire, which is called a stylet. That allows you to make the shape of the tube anything you want it to be. And in pediatric patients, the shape of the tube is often important because their airways are anterior. So we'll put a little curve on the end of this blade so that it's going up to the 12 o'clock uh, position. You can see that the tubes have a balloon. Now we want to test that balloon before we put it in the patient, but we would have the balloon deflated when we insert it. Otherwise, it would never pass past the vocal cords. So it's good to make sure the balloon doesn't leak because we're going to inflate that once it's in the trachea to make a good seal so secretions don't come in. And you can see this side channel that allows you to hook up a syringe and fill it with air or deflate it with air. Once the breathing tube's inserted, we would then, of course, remove the stylet. We would hook it up to our oxygen bag by removing the mask and we would put end tidal CO2 in. So the technique, just so you get a sense of it, is to go in midline with good mouth opening and your left hand is the laryngoscope. You lift up and away from yourself to expose the trachea. You may have an assistant that's providing a little bit of cricoid pressure on the trachea. You then using your right hand will ask your assistant to hand you your uh, and the tracheal tube, you'll insert it along the side. Now you'll notice that this laryngoscope has a channel down the center of it. The channel is not designed to put the tube down. The channel is for your eye, so you can continuously see the trachea. You never want to lose sight of that. And then you come in from the side with your breathing tube. I often will have an assistant grab the corner of the mouth and ask for lip retraction. They'll pull the lip down opening the mouth just a little bit more so I can slide that tube in sideways. Now the tubes come in various sizes. The mnemonic for pediatrics is the age of the patient plus 16 divided by 4. So let's say a 4-year-old patient, 4 plus 16 is 20 divided by 4 would be a 5-0 tube. 
If you're going to put a cuff tube in, which I always recommend, you may take a half size off and say they're going to have a 4.5 ET tube. But for simplicity's sake, let's say we're going to put a 5.0 cuff tube in this patient. How deep do we want to insert that tube? When do we know it's in the trachea and it's good enough? Well, there's some markings on the distal part of the tube by the balloon. There's two black lines that, as you see, the black lines go through the vocal cords. You can say that's good enough. But most people use the mnemonic of the outer diameter of the tube. So the 5.0 tube times 3 equals 15. So you would insert this tube to 15 centimeters, tape it, and secure it at that point. So to summarize, pediatric respiratory failure, again, is an anxiety-provoking procedure. If you are prepared, you have all the equipment that you need here at the ready. You have all the assistance in terms of respiratory therapy, nursing, fellows, and other residents to help you. You position the patient properly. You remember good bag, mask, suction techniques. You have adjuncts in terms of oral airways nasopharyngeal airways, laryngoscopes, and proper sized DT tubes, it really does make a procedure much less anxious and much more successful to be prepared. I hope you've enjoyed this Acaticus tutorial on airway readiness. As with anything in medicine, be aware that you can watch this tutorial as many times as you want so you can see one then you can come into this virtual reality space and use all the equipment and do all the things that I've done that you've seen in this video. So you can do one and then passing it on to the next learner, you can teach one. So the Academicus virtual platform allows you an immersive environment where you can see one, do one, and teach one. Thank you for joining me today.